The Children of the Pool by Arthur Mecken A couple of summers ago, I was staying with old friends in my native county on the Welsh border. It was in the heat and drought of a hot and dry year, and I came into those green, well-watered valleys with a sense of a great refreshment. Here was relief from the burning of London streets, from the close and airless nights, when all the myriad walls of brick and stone and concrete, and the pavements that are endless, give out into the heavy darkness the fires that all day long have been drawn from the sun, and from those roadways that have become like railways, with their changing lamps, and their yellow globes, and their bars and studs of steel, from the menace of instant death if your feet stray from the track, from all this, what a rest to walk under the green leaf in quiet, and hear the stream trickling from the heart of the hill. My friends were old friends, and they were urgent that I should go on my own way. There was breakfast at nine, but it was equally serviceable and excellent at ten, and I could be in for something cold for lunch if I liked, and if I didn't like, I could stay away till dinner at half-past seven. And then there was all the evening for talks about old times and about the changes, with comfortable drinks, and bed soothed by memories and tobacco, and by the brook that twisted under dark alders through the meadow below, and not a red bungalow to be seen for many a mile around. Sometimes, when the heat even in that green land was more than burning, and the wind from the mountains in the west ceased, I would stay all day under the shade on the lawn, but more often I went to field and trod remembered ways, and tried to find new ones in that happy and bewildered country. There paths go wandering into undiscovered valleys, there from deep and narrow lanes with overshadowing hedges, still smaller tracks that I suppose are old bridle paths, creep obscurely, obviously leading nowhere in particular. It was on a day of cooler air that I went adventuring abroad on such an expedition. It was a day of the veil. There were no clouds in the sky, but a high mist, gray and luminous, had been drawn all over it. At one moment it would seem that the sun must shine through, and the blue appear, and then the trees in the wood would seem to blossom, and the meadows lightened. And then again the veil would be drawn. I struck off by the stony lane that led from the back of the house up over the hill. I had last gone that way many years ago, of a winter afternoon, when the ruts were frozen into hard ridges, and dark pines on high places rose above snow, and the sun was red and still above the mountain. I remembered that the way had given good sport, with twists to right and left, and unexpected descents, and then risings to places of thorn and bracken, till it darkened to the hushed stillness of a winter's night, and I turned homeward reluctant. Now I took another chance with all the summer day before me, and resolved to come to some end and conclusion of the matter. I think I had gone beyond the point at which I had stopped and turned back as the frozen darkness and the bright stars came on me. I remembered the dip in the hedge, from which I saw the round tumulus on high at the end of the mountain wall and there was the white farm on the hillside, and the farmer was still calling to his dog, as he, or his father, had called before, his voice high and thin in the distance. After this point I seemed to be in undiscovered country. The ash trees grew densely on either side of the way, and met above it. I went on and on into the unknown, in the manner of the only good guidebooks, which are the tales of old nights. The road went down, and climbed, and again descended, all through the deep of the wood. Then, on both sides, the trees ceased, though the hedges were so high that I could see nothing of the way of the land about me, and just at the wood's ending there was one of those tracks or little paths of which I have spoken, going off from my lane on the right and winding out of sight quickly under all its leafage of hazel and wild rose, maple and hornbeam, with a holly here and there, and honeysuckle golden, and dark bryony shining and twining everywhere. 
I could not resist the invitation of a path so obscure and uncertain, and set out on its track of green and profuse grass, with the ground beneath still soft to the feet, even in the drought of that fiery summer. The way wound, as far as I could make out, on the slope of a hill, neither ascending nor descending, and after a mile or more of this rich walking, it suddenly ceased, and I found myself on a bare hillside, on a rough track that went down to a grey house. It was now a farm by its looks and surroundings, but there were signs of old state about it. Good sixteenth-century mullioned windows, with a Jacobean porch projecting from the centre, with dim armorial bearings mouldering above the door. It struck me that bread and cheese and cider would be grateful, and I beat upon the door with my stick, and brought a pleasant woman to open it. "'Do you think,' I began, "'you could be so good as—' And then came a shout from somewhere at the end of the stone passage, and a great voice called, "'Come in, then, come in, you old scoundrel, if your name is Merrick, as I'm sure it is.' I was amazed. The pleasant woman grinned and said, "'It seems you are well known here, sir, already, but perhaps you had heard that Mr. Roberts was staying here.' My old acquaintance, James Roberts, came tumbling out from his den at the back. He was a man whom I had known a long time, but not very well. Our affairs in London moved on different lines, and so we did not often meet. But I was glad to see him in that unexpected place. He was a round man, always florid and growing redder in the face with his years. He was a countryman of mine, but I had hardly known him before we both went to town, since his home had been at the northern end of the county. He shook me cordially by the hand, and looked as if he would like to smack me on the back. He was, a little, that kind of man, and repeated his, Come in, come in, adding to the pleasant woman, And bring you another plate, Mrs. Morgan, and all the rest of it. I hope you've not forgotten how to eat carefully cheese, Merrick. I can tell you there is none better than Mrs. Morgan's making. And, Mrs. Morgan, another jug of cider, and say their ta, mind you. I never knew whether he had been brought up as a boy to speak Welsh. In London he had lost all but the faintest trace of accent, but down here in Gwent the tones of the country had quickly returned to him, and he smacked as strongly of the old land in his speech as the cheerful farmer's wife herself. I judged his accent was a part of his holiday. He drew me into the little parlour with its old furniture and its pleasant old-fashioned ornaments and faintly flowering wallpaper, and set me in an elbow chair at the round table and gave me, as I told him, exactly what I had meant to ask for, bread and cheese and cider. All very good. Mrs. Morgan, it was clear, had the art of making a carfilly cheese that was succulent, a sort of white bel paese far different from those dry and stony cheeses that often bring dishonor on the Carfilly name. And afterwards, there was gooseberry jam and cream, and the tobacco that the country uses. Shag on the back, from the Welsh back, Bristol. And then there was gin. This last we partook of out of doors, in an old stone summer house, in the garden at the side. A white rose had grown all over the summer house, and shaded and glorified it. The water in the big jug had just been drawn from the well in the limestone rock, and I told Roberts gratefully that I felt a great deal better than when I had knocked at the farmhouse door. I told him where I was staying. He knew my host by name, and he, in turn, informed me that it was his first visit to Lonaputh, as the farm was called. A neighbor of his at Lee had recommended Mrs. Morgan's cooking very highly, and, as he said, you couldn't speak too well of her in that way or any other. We sipped and smoked through the afternoon in that pleasant retreat under the white roses. I meditated gratefully on the fact that I should not dare to enjoy shag on the back so freely in London, a potent tobacco, a full and ripe savor, but not for the hard streets. You say this farm is called Lanaputh, I interjected. That means by the pool, doesn't it? Where is the pool? I don't see it. Come, you, said Roberts, and I will show you. 
he took me by a little gate through the garden hedge of laurels, thick and high, and round to the left of the house, the opposite side to that by which I had made my approach. And there we climbed a green, rounded bastion of the old ages, and he pointed down to a narrow valley, shut in by steep wooded hills. There at the bottom was a level, half marshland and half black water, lying in still pools, with green islands of iris and of all manner of rank and strange growths that love to have their roots in slime. There is your pool for you, said Roberts. It was the most strange place, I thought, hidden away under the hills as if it were a secret. The steeps that went down to it were a tangle of undergrowth, of all manner of boughs mingled, with taller trees rising above the mass, and down at the edge of the marsh some of those had perished in the swampy water, and stood white and bare and ghastly, with leprous limbs. An ugly-looking place, I said to Roberts. I quite agree with you. It is an ugly place enough. They tell me at the farm it's not safe to go near it, or you may get fever, and I don't know what else. And, indeed, if you didn't go down carefully and watch your steps, you might easily find yourself up to the neck in that black muck there. We turned back into the garden and to our summer-house, and soon after it was time for me to make my way home. "'How long are you staying with Nickel?' Roberts asked me as we parted. I told him, and he insisted on my dining with him at the end of the week. "'I will send you,' he said. "'I will take you by a shortcut across the fields and see that you don't lose your way. Roast duck and green peas,' he added alluringly, "'and something good for the digestion afterwards. It was a fine evening when I next journeyed to the farm, but indeed we got tired of saying fine weather throughout that wonderful summer. I found Roberts cheery and welcoming, but, I thought, hardly in such rosy spirits as on my former visit. We were having a cocktail of his composition in the summer house, as the famous duck gained the last glow of brown perfection and I noticed that his speech was not bubbling so freely from him as before. He fell silent once or twice, and looked thoughtful. He told me he'd ventured down to the pool, the swampy place at the bottom, and it looks no better when you see it close at hand, black oily stuff that isn't like water, with scum upon it, and weeds like a lot of monsters. I never saw such queer ugly plants." There's one rank-looking thing down there, covered with dull crimson blossoms, all bloated out and speckled like a toad. You're no botanist, I remarked. No, not I. I know buttercups and daisies, and not much more. Mrs. Morgan here was quite frightened when I told her where I'd been. She said she hoped I mightn't be sorry for it. But I feel as well as ever. I don't think there are many places left in the country now where you can get malaria. We proceeded to the duck and the green peas, and rejoiced in their perfection. There was some very old ale that Mr. Morgan had bought when an ancient tavern in the neighborhood had been pulled down. Its age and original excellence had combined to make a drink like a rare wine. The something good for the digestion turned out to be a mellow brandy that Roberts had brought with him from town. I told him that I had never known a better hour. He warmed up with the good meat and drink, and was cheery enough, and yet I thought there was a reserve, something obscure, at the back of his mind that was by no means cheerful. We had a second glass of the mellow brandy, and Roberts, after a moment's indecision, spoke out. He dropped his holiday game of Welsh countrymen completely. "'You wouldn't think, would you?' he began, that a man would come down to a place like this to be blackmailed at the end of the journey. Good Lord, I gasped in amazement. I should think not. What's happened? He looked very grave. I thought even that he looked frightened. Well, I'll tell you. A couple of nights ago, I went for a stroll after my dinner, a beautiful night with the moon shining and a nice clean breeze. So I walked up over the hill and then took the path that leads down through the wood to the brook. I'd got into the wood, fifty yards or so, when I heard my name called out. Roberts! James Roberts! 
in a shrill, piercing voice, a young girl's voice, and I jumped pretty well out of my skin, I can tell you. I stopped dead and stared all about me. Of course, I could see nothing at all. Bright moonlight and black shadow and all those trees. Anybody could hide. Then it came to me that there was some girl of the place having a game with her sweetheart. James Roberts is a common enough name, especially in this part of the country. So I was just going on, not bothering my head about the local love affairs, when that scream came right in my ear. Roberts! Roberts! James Roberts! And then half a dozen words that I won't trouble you with. Not yet, at any rate. I have said that Roberts was by no means an intimate friend of mine but I had always known him as a genial, cordial fellow, a thoroughly good-natured man, and I was sorry and shocked, too, to see him sitting there wretched and dismayed. He looked as if he had seen a ghost. He looked much worse than that. He looked as if he had seen terror. But it was too early to press him closely. I said, What did you do then? I turned about and ran back through the wood and tumbled over the stile. I got home here as quick as ever I could, and shut myself up in this room, dripping with fright and gasping for breath. I was almost crazy, I believe. I walked up and down. I sat in the chair and got up again. I wondered whether I should wake up in my bed and find I'd been having a nightmare. I cried at last. I'll tell you the truth. I put my head in my hands, and the tears ran down my cheeks. I was quite broken. But... Look here, I said, isn't this making a great to-do about very little? I can quite see it must have been a nasty shock. But how long did you say you had been staying here? Ten days, was it? A fortnight to-morrow. Well, you know country ways as well as I do. You may be sure that everybody within three or four miles of Lanapith knows about a gentleman from London, a Mr. James Roberts, staying at the farm and there are always unpleasant young people to be found wherever you go. I gather that this girl used very abusive language when she hailed you. She probably thought it was a good joke. You had taken that walk through the wood in the evening a couple of times before. No doubt you had been noticed going that way, and the girl and her friend or friends planned to give you a shock. I wouldn't think any more of it if I were you. He almost cried out. Think any more of it? What will the world think of it? There was an anguish of terror in his voice. I thought it was time to come to cues. I spoke up pretty briskly. Now look here, Roberts. It's no good beating about the bush. Before we can do anything, we've got to have the whole tale fair and square. What I've gathered is this. You go for a walk in a wood near here one evening, and a girl, you say it was a girl's voice, hails you by your name and then screams out a lot of filthy language. Is there anything more in it than that? There's a lot more than that. I was going to ask you not to let it go any further, but as far as I can see, there won't be any secret in it much longer. There's another end to the story, and it goes back a good many years, to the time when I first came to London as a young man. That's twenty-five years ago. He stopped speaking. When he began again, I could feel that he spoke with unutterable repugnance. Every word was a horror to him. You know, as well as I do, that there are all sorts of turnings in London that a young fellow can take, good, bad, and indifferent. There was a good deal of bad luck about it. I do believe, and I was too young to know or care much where I was going, but I got into a turning with the black pit at the end of it. He beckoned me to lean forward across the table, and whispered for a minute or two in my ear. In my turn, I heard not without horror. I said nothing. That was what I heard shrieked out in the wood. What do you say? You've done with all that long ago. It was done with very soon after it was begun. It was no more than a bad dream. And then it all flashed back on me like deadly lightning. What do you say? What can I do? I told him that I had to admit that it was no good to try to put the business in the wood down to accident. The casual filthy language of a depraved village girl. As I said, it couldn't be a case of a bow drawn at a venture. 
There must be somebody behind it. Can you think of anybody? There may be one or two left. I can't say. I haven't heard of any of them for years. I thought they had all gone, dead or at the other side of the world. Yes, but people can get back from the other side of the world pretty quickly in these days. Yokohama is not much farther off than Yarmouth. But you haven't heard of any of these people lately. As I said, not for years, but the secret's out. But let's consider. Who is this girl? Where does she live? We must get at her and try if we can't frighten the life out of her. And, in the first place, we'll find out the source of her information. Then we shall know where we are. I suppose you have discovered who she is. I have not a notion of who she is or where she lives. I dare say you wouldn't care to ask the Morgans any questions. But to go back to the beginning, you spoke of blackmail. Did the stand girl ask you for money to shut her mouth? No, I shouldn't have called this blackmail. She didn't say anything about money. Well... That sounds more hopeful. Let's see. Tonight is Saturday. You took this unfortunate walk of yours a couple of nights ago, on Thursday night, and you haven't heard anything more since. I should keep away from that wood and try to find out who the young lady is. That's the first thing to be done, clearly. I was trying to cheer him up a little, but he only stared at me with his horror-stricken eyes. It didn't finish with the wood, he groaned. My bedroom is next door to this room where we are. When I had pulled myself together a bit that night, I had a stiff glass, about double my allowance, and went off to bed and to sleep. I woke up with a noise of tapping at the window, just by the head of the bed. Tap, 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 it went. I thought it might be a bow beating on the glass, and then I heard that voice calling me, James Roberts, open, open! I tell you, my flesh crawled on my bones. I would have cried out, but I couldn't make a sound. The moon had gone down, and there is a great old pear tree close to the window, and it was quite dark. I sat up in my bed, shaking for fear. It was dead still, and I began to think that the fright I had got in the wood had given me nightmare. Then the voice called out again, and louder. James Roberts, open quick! And I had to open... I leaned half out of bed and got at the latch and opened the window a little. I didn't dare to look out, but it was too dark to see anything in the shadow of the tree. And then she began to talk to me. She told me all about it from the beginning. She knew all the names. She knew where my business was in London and where I lived and who my friends were. She said that they should all know. And she said, and you yourself shall tell them, and you shall not be able to keep back a single word. The wretched man fell back in his chair, shuddering and gasping for breath. He beat his hands up and down with a gesture of hopeless fear and misery, and his lips grinned with dread. I won't say that I began to see the light, but I saw a hint of certain possibilities of light, or, let us say, of a lessening of the darkness. I said a soothing word or two, and let him get a little more quiet. The telling of this extraordinary and very dreadful experience had set his nerves all dancing, and yet, having made a clean breast of it all, I could see that he felt some relief. His hands lay quiet on the table, and his lips ceased their horrible grimacing. He looked at me with a faint expectancy, I thought, as if he had begun to cherish a dim hope that I might have some sort of help for him. He could not see himself the possibility of rescue. Still, one never knew what resources and freedoms the other man might bring. That, at least, was what his poor, miserable face seemed to me to express. And I hoped I was right, and let him simmer a little, and gather to himself such twigs and straws of hope as he could. Then I began again. This was on the Thursday night, and last night, another visit. The same as before almost word for word. And it was all true, what she said. The girl was not lying. Every word of it was true. There were some things that I had forgotten myself, but when she spoke of them, I remembered at once. There was the number of a house in a certain street, for example. If you had asked me for that number a week ago, 
I should have told you, quite honestly, that I knew nothing about it. But when I heard it, I knew it in the instant. I could see that number in the light of a street lamp. The sky was dark and cloudy, and a bitter wind was blowing, and driving the leaves on the pavement, that November night. When the fire was lit, that night when they appeared, and you haven't seen this girl, you couldn't describe her. I was afraid to look, I told you. I waited when she stopped speaking. I sat there for half an hour or an hour. Then I lit my candle and shut the window latch. It was three o'clock and growing light. I was thinking it over. I noted that Roberts confessed that every word spoken by his visitant was true. She had sprung no surprises on him. There had been no suggestions of fresh details, names, or circumstances. That struck me as having a certain possible significance. In the knowledge of Robert's present circumstances, his city address, and his home address, and the names of his friends, that was interesting, too. There was a glimpse of a possible hypothesis. I could not be sure, but I told Roberts that I thought something might be done. To begin with, I said, I was going to keep him company for the night. Nickel would guess that I had shirked the walk home after nightfall. That would be quite all right. And in the morning, he was to pay Mrs. Morgan for the two extra weeks he had arranged to stay, with something by way of compensation. And it should be something handsome, I added, with emotion, thinking of the duck and the old ale. And then, I finished, I shall pack you off to the other side of the island. Of that old ale, I made him drink a liberal dose by way of a sleeping draught. He hardly needed a hypnotic. The terror that he had endured and the stress of telling it had worn him out. I saw him fall into bed and fall asleep in a moment, and I crawled up, comfortably enough, in a roomy armchair. There was no trouble in the night, and when I writhed myself awake, I saw Roberts sleeping peacefully. I left him alone and wandered about the house and the shining morning garden, till I came upon Mrs. Morgan, busy in the kitchen. I broke the trouble to her. I told her that I was afraid that the place was not agreeing at all with Mr. Roberts. Indeed, I said, he was taken so ill last night that I was afraid to leave him. His nerves seemed to be in a very bad way. Indeed, then, I don't wonder at all, replied Mrs. Morgan, with a very grave face. But I wondered a good deal at this remark of hers not having a notion as to what she meant. I went on to explain what I had arranged for our patient, as I called him. East Coast breezes, and crowds of people, the noisier the better, and, indeed, that was the cure that I had in mind. I said that I was sure Mr. Roberts would do the proper thing. That will be all right, sir, I am sure. Don't you trouble yourself about that. But the sooner you get him away after I have given you both your breakfasts, the better I shall be pleased. I am frightened to death for him, I can tell you. And she went off to her work, murmuring something that sounded like, Plant de puth, plant de puth. I gave Roberts no time for reflection. I woke him up, bustled him out of bed, hurried him through his breakfast, saw him pack his suitcase, make his farewells to the Morgans, and had him sitting in the shade on Nichols' lawn, well before the family were back from church. I gave Nickel a vague outline of the circumstances, nervous breakdown and so forth, introduced them to one another, and left them talking about the Black Mountains, Robert's land of origin. The next day, I saw him off at the station, on his way to Great Yarmouth, via London. I told him with an air of authority that he would have no more trouble, from any quarter, I emphasized and he was to write me at my town address in a week's time. And, by the way, I said, just before the train slid along the platform, here's a bit of Welsh for you. What does Plantiputh mean? Something of the pool. Plantiputh, he explained, means children of the pool. When my holiday was ended, and I had got back to town, I began my investigations into the case of James Roberts and his nocturnal visitant. When he began his story, I was extremely distressed. I made no doubt as to the bare truth of it, and was shocked to think of a very kindly man threatened with overwhelming disgrace and disaster. There seemed nothing impossible in the tale stated at large, and in the first outline. 
it is not altogether unheard of for very decent men to have had a black patch in their lives, which they have done their best to live down and atone for and forget. Often enough, the explanation for such misadventure is not hard to seek. You have a young fellow, very decently but very simply brought up among simple country folk, suddenly pitched into the labyrinth of London, into a maze in which there are many turnings, as the unfortunate Roberts put it, which lead to disaster, or to something blacker than disaster. The more experienced man, the man of keener instincts and perceptions, knows the aspects of these tempting passages and avoids them. Some have the wits to turn back in time. A few are caught in the trap at the end, and in some cases, though there may be apparent escape and peace and security for many years, the teeth of the snare are about the man's leg all the while, and close at last on highly reputable chairmen and church wardens and pillars of all sorts of seemly institutions. And then jail, or, at best, hissing and extinction. So, on the face of it, I was by no means prepared to pooh-pooh Robert's tale. But when he came to detail, and I had time to think it over, that entirely illogical faculty, which sometimes takes charge of our thoughts and judgments, told me that there was some huge flaw in all this, that somehow or other things had not happened so. This mental process, I may say, is strictly indefinable and unjustifiable by any laws of thought that I have ever heard of. It won't do to take our stand with Bishop Butler and declare with him that probability is the guide of life, deducing from this premise the conclusion that the improbable doesn't happen. Any man who cares to glance over his experience of the world and of things in general is aware the most wildly improbable events are constantly happening. For example, I take up today's paper, sure that I shall find something to my purpose, and in a minute I come across the headline, Damaging a Model Elephant. A father, evidently a man of substance, accuses his son of this strange offense. Last summer, the father told the court his son constructed in their front garden a large model of an elephant the material being bought by a witness. The skeleton of the elephant was made of tubing, and it was covered with soil and fiber, and held together with wire netting. Flowers were planted on it, and it cost three pound five shillings. A photograph of the elephant was produced in court, and the clerk remarked, it is a fearsome looking thing. And then the catastrophe. The son got to know a married woman much older than himself, and his parents frowned, and there were quarrels. And so, one night, the young man came to his father's house, jumped over the garden wall, and tried to push the elephant over. Failing, he proceeded to disembowel the elephant with a pair of wire clippers. There, nothing can be much more improbable than that tale, but it all happened so, as the Daily Telegraph assures me, and I believe every word of it. And I have no doubt that if I care to look, I shall find something as improbable, or even more improbable, in the newspaper columns three or perhaps four times a week. What about the old man, unknown, unidentified, found in the Thames, in one pocket a stone Buddha, in the other a leather wallet with the inscription, The hen that sits on the china egg is best off. The improbable happens and is constantly happening. But, Using that faculty with which I am unable to define, I rejected Robert's Girl of the Wood and the Window. I did not suspect him for a moment of a leg-pulling of an offensive and vicious kind. His misery and terror were too clearly manifest for that, and I was certain that he was suffering from a very serious and dreadful shock, and yet I didn't believe in the truth of the story he had told me. I felt convinced that there was no girl in the case either in the wood or at the window, and when Roberts told me, with increased horror, that every word she spoke was true, and that she had even reminded him of matters that he himself had forgotten, I was greatly encouraged in my growing surmise, for it seemed to me at least probable that if the case had been such as he supposed it, there would have been new and damning circumstances in the story, utterly unknown to him and unsuspected by him. But, as it was, 
Everything that he was told, he accepted, as a man in a dream accepts without hesitation the wildest fantasies as matters and incidents of his daily experience. Decidedly, there was no girl there. On the Sunday that he spent with me at the Wern, Nichols' place, I took advantage of his calmer condition. The night's rest had done him good to get some facts and dates out of him, and when I returned to town, I put these to the test. It was not altogether an easy investigation, since, on the surface at least, the matters to be investigated were eminently trivial. The early days of a young man from the country up in London in a business house, and twenty-five years ago, even really exciting murder trials and changes of ministries become blurred and uncertain in outline, if not forgotten, in twenty-five years, or in twelve years for that matter, and compared with such events, the affair of James Roberts seemed perilously like nothing at all. However, I made the best use I could of the information that Roberts had given me, and I was fortified for the task by a letter I received from him. He told me that there had been no recurrence of the trouble, as he expressed it, that he felt quite well, and was enjoying himself immensely at Yarmouth. He said that the shows and entertainments on the sands were doing him no end of good. There is a retired executioner who does his old business in a tent, with the drop and everything. And there is a bloke who calls himself Archbishop of London, who fasts in a glass case, with his mitre and all his togs on. Certainly, my patient was either recovered or in a very fair way to recovery. I could set about my researches in a calm spirit of scientific curiosity, without the nervous tension of the surgeon called upon at short notice to perform a life-or-death operation. As a matter of fact, it was all the more simple than I thought it would be. True, the results were nothing, or almost nothing, but that was exactly what I had expected and hoped. With the slight sketch of his early career in London, furnished me by Roberts, the horrors omitted by my request, with a name or two and a date or two, I got along very well. And what did it come to? Simply this. Here was a lad, he was just seventeen, who had been brought up amongst lonely hills and educated at a small grammar school, furnished through a London uncle with a very small stool in a city office. By arrangement, Settled after a long and elaborate correspondence, he was to board with some distant cousins who lived in the Cricklewood, Kilburn, Brondisbury region, and with them he settled down, comfortably enough, as it seemed, though cousin Ellen objected to his learning to smoke in his bedroom, and begged him to desist. The household consisted of cousin Ellen, her husband, Henry Watts, and the two daughters, Helen and Justine. Justine was about Robert's own age, Helen three or four years older. Mr. Watts had married rather late in life, and had retired from his office a year or so before. He interested himself chiefly in tuberous rooted begonias, and in the season went out a few miles to his cricket club and watched the game on Saturday afternoons. Every morning there was breakfast at eight. Every evening there was high tea at seven, and in the meantime, Young Roberts did his best in the city, and liked his job well enough. He was shy with the two girls at first, but Justine was lively, and couldn't help having a voice like a peacock, and Helen was adorable, and so things went on very pleasantly for a year or perhaps eighteen months, on this basis, that Justine was a great joke, and that Helen was adorable. The trouble was that Justine didn't think that she was a great joke. For it must be said that Robert's stay with his cousins ended in disaster. I rather gather that the young man and the quiet Helen were guilty of, shall we say, amiable indiscretions, though without serious consequences. But it appeared that cousin Justine, a girl with black eyes and black hair, made discoveries which she resented savagely denouncing the offenders at the top of that piercing voice of hers, in the waste hours of the Brondisbury night, to the immense rage, horror, and consternation of the whole house. In fact, there was the devil to pay, and Mr. Watts, then and there, turned young Roberts out of the house, 
and there is no doubt that he should have been thoroughly ashamed of himself. But, young man, nothing very much happened. Old Watts had cried in his rage that he would let Robert's chief in the city hear the whole story. But, on reflection, he held his tongue. Roberts roamed about London for the rest of the night, refreshing himself occasionally at coffee stalls. When the shops opened, he had a wash and brush up, and was prompt and bright at his office. At midday, in the underground smoking room of the tea shop, he conferred with the fellow clerk over their dominoes, and arranged to share rooms with him out of Norwood Way. From that point onwards, the career of James Roberts had been eminently quiet, uneventful, successful. Now, everybody, I suppose, is aware that in recent years, the silly business of divination by dreams has ceased to be a joke, and has become a very serious science. It is called psychoanalysis, and is compounded, I would say, by mingling one grain of sense with a hundred of pure nonsense. From the simplest and most obvious dreams, the psychoanalyst deduces the most incongruous and extravagant results. A black savage tells him that he has dreamed of being chased by lions, or maybe by crocodiles, and the psychoman knows at once that the black is suffering from the Oedipus complex, that is, he is madly in love with his own mother, and is, therefore, afraid of the vengeance of his father. Everybody knows, of course, that lion and crocodile are symbols of father, and I understand that there are educated people who believe this stuff. It is all nonsense, to be sure, and so much the greater nonsense inasmuch as the true interpretation of many dreams, not by any means of all dreams, moves, it may be said, in the opposite direction to the method of the psychoanalysis. The psychoanalyst infers the monstrous and abnormal from a trifle. It is often safe to reverse the process. If a man dreams that he has committed a sin before which the sun hid his face, it is often safe to conjecture that, in sheer forgetfulness, he wore a red tie or brown boots with evening dress. A slight dispute with the vicar may deliver him in sleep into the clutches of the Spanish Inquisition and the torment of a fiery death. Failure to catch the post with a rather important letter will sometimes bring a great realm to ruin in the world of dreams. And here, I have no doubt, we have the explanation, or part of the explanation, of the Roberts affair. Without question, he had been a bad boy. There was something more than a trifle at the heart of his trouble, but the original offense, grave as we may think it, had, in his hidden conscience, swollen and exaggerated itself into a monstrous mythology of evil. Some time ago, a learned and curious investigator demonstrated how Coleridge had taken a bald sentence from an old chronicler and had made it the nucleus of the ancient mariner. With a vast gesture of the spirit, he had unconsciously gathered from all the four seas of his vast reading all manner of creatures into his net till the bare hint of the old book glowed into one of the great masterpieces of the world's poetry. Roberts had nothing in him of the poetic faculty, nothing of the shaping power of the imagination, no trace of the gift of expression by which the artist delivers his soul of its burden. In him, as in many men, there was a great gulf fixed between the hidden and the open consciousness, so that which could not come out into the light grew and swelled secretly, hugely, horribly, in the darkness. If Roberts had been a poet, or a painter, or a musician, we might have had a masterpiece. As he was neither, we had a monster. And I do not at all believe that his years had consciously been vexed by a deep sense of guilt. I gathered in the course of my researches that not long after the flight from Brondisbury, Roberts was made aware of unfortunate incidents in the Watts saga, if we may use this honored term, which convinced him that there were extenuating circumstances in his offense and excuses for his wrongdoing. The actual fact had, no doubt, been forgotten or remembered very slightly, rarely, casually, without any sense of grave moment or culpability attached to it. While, all the while, a pageantry of horror was being secretly formed in the hidden places of the man's soul. 
and at last, after the years of growth and swelling in the darkness, the monster leapt into the light, and with such violence that to the victim it seemed an actual and objective entity. And, in a sense, it had risen from the black waters of the pool. I was reading a few days ago, in a review of a grave book on psychology, the following very striking sentences. The things which we distinguish as qualities or values are inherent in the real environment to make the configuration that they do make with our sensory response to them. There is such a thing as a sad landscape, even when we who look at it are feeling jovial. And if we think it is sad, only because we attribute to it something derived from our own past associations with sadness, Professor Kafka gives us good reason to regard the view as superficial, that is, not imputing human attributes to what are described as demand characters in the environment, but giving proper recognition to the other end of a nexus, of which only one end is organized in our own mind. Psychology is, I am sure, a difficult and subtle science, which, perhaps naturally, must be expressed in subtle and difficult language. But, so far as I can gather, the sense of the passage which I have quoted, it comes to this, that a landscape, a certain configuration of wood, water, height and depth, light and dark, flower and rock, is, in fact, an objective reality, a thing, just as opium and wine are things, not clouded fancies, mere creatures of our make-believe, to which we give a kind of spurious reality and efficacy. The dreams of De Quincey were a synthesis of De Quincey, plus opium. The riotous gaiety of Charles Surface and his friends was the product and result of the wine they had drunk, plus their personalities. So the profound Professor Kafka, his book is called Principles of Gestalt Psychology, insists that the sadness which we attribute to a particular landscape is really and efficiently in the landscape and not merely in ourselves, and consequently that the landscape can affect us and produce results in us in precisely the same manner as drugs and meat and drink affect us in their several ways. Poe, who knew many secrets, knew this, and taught that landscape gardening was as truly a fine art as poetry or painting, since it availed to communicate the mysteries to the human spirit. And perhaps Mrs. Morgan of Lanaputh Farm put all this much better in the speech of symbolism, when she murmured about the children of the pool. For if there is a landscape of sadness, there is certainly also a landscape of a horror of darkness and evil. And that black and oily depth overshadowed with twisted woods, with its growth of foul weeds and its dead trees and leprous boughs, was assuredly potent in terror. To Roberts it was a strong drug, a drug of evocation, the black deep without calling to the black deep within, and summoning the inhabitant thereof to come forth. I made no attempt to extract the legend of that dark place from Mrs. Morgan, and I do not suppose that she would have been communicative if I had questioned her. But it has struck me as possible, and even probable, that Roberts was by no means the first to experience the power of the pool. Old stories often turn out to be true. <laughs>